So Wesley Morris, welcome. It's good to talk to you. Uh, Josh, it's nice to be here. Thanks for having me. I mean, having, yeah, thanks for having me as part of this massive event. Thank you for talking to me. I really am honored and happy to be here. It's kind of a weird time. It's a weird circumstance. First of all, the fact that we're doing this conversation like this, yeah. and then with all of, of everything that's going on, um, your podcast is called Still Processing. What are you processing right now? Like what, what's top of the processing list these days? You know, I mean, all the sort of existential questions that, that, that a, like a question that you're asking would lead one to go to um, are things that I'm actually thinking about. But I mean, I, these are questions that, I mean, the things that are happening right now in this country are the things that I, um, I'm always thinking about this stuff. You know, I've been thinking about this stuff since I was a teenager. <laughs> you know, with respect to um, who we are as Black Americans, um, who we are as individual people in this larger system that, you know, we call America. Um, you know, what kind of human being do I want to be? What kind of human being do I expect other people to be in relation to me? Um, what am I afraid of? And when, like, why should people be afraid of me? Um, you know, these are all questions that I, are like concerns or um, wonderings that I've been having since, since I can remember. And I think what's interesting about what's happening now is I think that there are more willing people to, more people willing to hear us ask those questions out loud and have not, if they don't have an answer for them, they're much more willing, I would say, in this moment than, than previously. Some people, because you know, you know, there's still, there's still, uh, you know, the, the ye old, you know, racial justice counter protesters. Um, the people who just get terrified, the white people, we should just say that. <laughs> it's important to clarify. Um, who fear that, you know, any, any advance that is made on behalf of a non-white person is, you know, like two atoms can't occupy or two molecules can't occupy the same space at the same time. That doesn't really apply to the way race works in America, but this sort of institutionalization um, of, of racial hierarchy makes people think that that's true. That in order for you as, as, a, as a black person, for instance, to have something means that I'm gonna lose something as a white person. Um, that's never been true, ever. Um, and yet, you know, part of what we're seeing happen right now with respect to the counter protests um, in response to, you know, any number of the, of the eruptions for justice that's happened, that, that have been happening across this country since Memorial Day, um, you know, there is, nobody's really articulating anything about what this is about, but, but you know the underlying concern, which is that like I, as a white person, um, have been told that this country is mine and people are once again trying to take it away from, from me. Um, and we can't have that. For me, at least, I'm curious to know more for you. For me, at least, it intersected with my awareness of what it meant to be Black in America mm -hmm. and my coming out process. Mm -hmm. I think my coming out process, which was hard in its own ways, but for me, especially as someone who's basically known he wanted to be in broadcasting since he was like five mm -hmm. and made the decision when he was 10. So mm -hmm. this has been like a 30 year journey. Thank mm -hmm. you, NBC, for, for, for doing more than any therapist could ever do just by hiring me. I think what, oh, what it deep. meant for, it, I'm, look, but look, here's the thing. I think what allowed me to get here was dealing with my coming out process the way I did, because I had to wrestle with can I be gay and can I be a broadcast journalist? Now, it wasn't so much where I lived because I'm from South Florida. So asking if you can be gay on television in Miami is a dumb question. The answer is yes. But <laughs> I, I mean, it's yes. But I ultimately came to the realization that 
I personally could not make a career telling the truth about everyone else's life and lying about my own. Mm -hmm. I can't do it. Some people have to be closeted because they live in parts of the country or the world where the lives are in danger. That's fine. I lived in Fort Lauderdale. But even if I moved, I needed to either not be gay so that someone couldn't hold my story over me as leverage, or I needed to just own who I am so I can live my life. And the benefit of that, for me at least, and I'd, I'd love to hear kind of your version of this, but the benefit of that for me is that it empathized me in a way that made me a sharper interviewer. Because mm. if I'm free to be who I am, then I can make space for you to be free to be who you are. And so if I deal with the things in my life that make me feel vulnerable, then I'll be a good steward of your vulnerability and you're more likely to open up and say all manner of things in very revelatory ways. And it just allowed me to get farther with interviews. So for me, professionally and personally, they lock together way tighter than I ever could have imagined. And I'm interested to know how, how your coming out journey kind of informed this for you. I'm sure that in addition to just cultural criticism and thinking about accountability of larger structures, that the way you came out, what you learned through coming out, and I'm not presuming that process is done because you never come out once, but how that shaped kind of your worldview and your your professional view, if that makes sense. Um like how that journey shaped you. Uh, I have two answers to that question. One answer is my mother didn't care. <laughs> you know, she, she was, I mean, you know how, I mean, I don't know if this is true for all mothers, but most of the mothers, even the mothers who want to deny that they, that they, or the mothers who don't like it, uh, that their, that their child, the children turn out to be queer. Um, they know. They know, they know. And you know, my mom, my mom knew. And she was, when I told her, I mean, it was, she was the second person I told. Um, and she was the person who, I mean, the first person I told, who I'll get to in a second, was also fine with it. But um, my mother was just like, how is this gonna change anything about us? I mean, she gave me the, the thing that a lot of parents and, you know, when did I come out? In 1997, 98, 97. Um, she basically said, I want you to be safe. And I just want you to be happy. And if you can manage those two things, we're going to be fine. And if you're not happy, we can talk about that. And if you're not safe, we're going to talk about that. Um, and I'm like, okay. I couldn't have asked for a better scenario. Although we can, I've got a whole comedy routine about people telling gay people to be safe. What else? You know who needed yeah, to be we, I, safe? Yeah, you read my mind. We'll have that conversation offline. We it's a separate thing, but my mother said it out of love and she didn't, I mean, we have, I mean, there are people in my family, you know, I've got, I've got some people in my family who've gotten HIV, died of AIDS, just, you know, it, it wasn't, I knew where she was coming from, but I'm just saying right. in general, telling, a new gay person or any 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 non-straight person to 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 practice safe sex expletives to you just just expletives so the other part of your question is um the other sort of formative aspect of my coming out is i spent a lot of my college years with artists and athletes most of the artists were out, none of the athletes were. And just knowing who I was gonna be, I knew, I knew I wasn't gonna, I knew I probably wasn't gonna make art. And I knew I probably wasn't, I knew I wasn't gonna play a sport, but a lot of my friends are and were athletes. Um, and I knew that I didn't want to live a life, and this is, this is in determining what I was going to do about my sexuality, which in college I was really freaked out by, um, about how to handle it, because I knew I was gay, um, and I, I had never, I didn't know what to do about it. I also didn't know what it even meant. Do you know what I mean? Like, beyond the, beyond the attraction part, like, 
I'd have to find a culture to be a part of if that was the thing I also wanted to do. But I definitely knew I did not want to not be gay. Um, I, wanted to, I wanted to be the person who I felt like I was that my mother eventually would tell me she knew, my, she knew me to be. But I also knew that I didn't want to be one of these people who, like an athlete, which I wasn't, again, um, but I saw these people sort of struggle with how to be, how to get out of the box they were put in and also be the person that they understood themselves to be and like which had the stronger pull, the box or your, or your understanding of who you are. And I, it's 2020, we still don't really have any openly gay people playing, any men playing professional sports in the United States at the professional level. And I, I knew that whatever they're struggling with was a thing I knew I didn't want to struggle with. I wanted to have, struggle with all the other stuff that I'd be struggling with in my life. And like, like getting getting the getting the declaration of my of my sexual orientation out of the way allowed me to understand, you know, myself as a as a I, I mean as a gay man on the one hand, but also as a sexual person on the other hand. But one thing that I think recently that provoked a very strong empathetic response from people in ways I don't think many of us expected, or at least that I didn't expect. Mm -hmm. was the very unexpected death of Chadwick Boseman, who died mm -hmm. of colon cancer oh. at the age of 43. Mm -hmm. And I think, A, because no one really knew he was sick. Like, mm -hmm. he had what? And he's how? It just kind of, like, blindsided everyone. Yeah. Yeah. But B, because of the impact he had in his movies, especially in, obviously, Black Panther, but even also Jackie Robinson, Thurgood Marshall, James Brown. You wrote a piece about Chadwick Boseman and what Black Panther meant to you. Talk about the response to that, that kind of, that kind of speaks to that connection? Um, I think people were really gratified in terms of, I mean, as far as I can tell, they were gratified that, that I took his work seriously, but also that, I mean, it, it was hard to, to do that because it wasn't like, you know, a person who had this full career had died where you've got like, decades of work where you're like, you know, I mean, how, where to start when Prince dies, where do you even start? Um, I mean, Chadwick Boseman, Chadwick Boseman had, had starred in only like a handful of movies when he died. His career, as far as I was concerned, was about to enter this really fascinating new place. Um, so what you have though, is this very surprising body of work that is really about goodness and bestness and excellence um, individually and as part of this national mosaic of, of Black life. Um, and he did it kind of under our noses and in front of our eyes. And it, it could only have been with his death that you could see that this wasn't just an actor, but a historian who really had a sense of the kind of people he thought he wanted to play um because he looks like none of those people i mean t'challa he can look like whoever i mean you know he he is t'challa but he doesn't look like james brown or thurgood marshall or jackie robinson but he embodied something really crucial about them with respect to you know with at least jackie robinson and thurgood marshall their goodness and with jack with james brown his greatness um you know james brown despite all his you know personal contradictions and, but also because of his personal contradictions, is one of the greatest Americans ever. And so here you have Chadwick Boseman playing three of those people. And um, it just seemed, it, it just seemed too, too beautiful to be true. And yet it was, I mean, between T'Challa and those three, you know, real life Americans, he, he embodied something really crucial and, and true about this country. And I think people were happy to have somebody point that out. I'm the lucky guy and you know, unfortunate guy who had to do it. I think one of the things recently that's made this work so kind of, at times crazy making and at times satisfying, and at times very unsettling for me, 
is that you're covering something that you can't help but be living because we're grappling with all of these cultural moments, the Black Lives Matter movement, the resurgence of the Me Too movement, the Trump administration, like all of these things kind of hit you on a personal level. And for me, I've had to figure out how much of myself to show mm -hmm. and how much of myself remains inviolate and how much of myself remains private, even though I'm a public person. How do you walk that line in terms of what to show and how to show it, particularly with those two pieces, when they're both cultural in a larger sense, but also deeply personal in a really visceral way? Um, it just would have, it would have felt weird to me as a person who is also partially an essayist to not acknowledge the, that I suffered in some ways too. Um, and, and that I wasn't disconnected from this. I mean, I think that, you know, there's a way that for some people to think that because, you know, I am a, I am not a poor black person who lives in um, public housing, that I'm somehow removed from the day-to-day -day struggles of a person like George Floyd or you know the life changes that Breonna Taylor was was putting herself through to to you know make herself to give herself a great life. Um, I always think that I'm one of the lucky people because I know how I grew up, and I know that were it not for a couple of things happening to and for me, that my life would be very different. Um, I don't feel disconnected from those people. Um, I don't feel disconnected from those worlds. Um, and so anytime you watch someone die on, on video, um, and that person died for no real reason other than the fact that he is a black man, it just kind of, it, it destroys a little part of you because you know it to be true, and you've seen it numerous times, but you're never a nerd to it. And so I think that there was something, I mean, the George Floyd video in particular is a, you know, part of the, its power is that all it can do is engender empathy. Um, you know, the amazing thing about the video was that's the only time in this country that I can recall. I mean, there have probably there have been other other there have been other things. Not the only time, but it's one of the very few examples where I feel like there was no. I mean, there are Facebook posts that will contradict what I'm about to say, but by and large, there was no way to watch. If you watch that video, there's no way to watch it and and leave understanding what had happened, like how that is a way a person a person should be treated. Who had done nothing essentially and was begging for his life. Um, I felt like I couldn't write something and not acknowledge that that the I too was was ripped open. I, I I struggle with it, especially because you know I I'm a news anchor, and so my and having come from 16 plus years in NPR or in public radio in general, including three on NPR, my job description requires me to stay out of commentary. You know, there are analysts and there are commentators. And it was really clear, if you're a host, if you are speaking about the news, you are an analyst. You're not mm -hmm. making, you know, we should, I believe the government ought to statements. Like that could cost you your standing, if not your job. So part of what I was able to figure out how to do in public radio and now on television is to write essays where I could try to put something out there that's thought provoking and personal that doesn't presume what the answer should be. Mm -hmm. I think I have, I learned a long time ago that questions are far more powerful than answers. Mm -hmm. Whoever's asking the questions in a conversation is in control. We were successful on NPR because we asked for people's stories rather than their opinions, because I can't argue your life. 
And so if I ask you to tell your story, there's only one thing the audience can do. Listen, mm -hmm. we all just have to listen because none of us can react to a story that's not over yet. Right. So by sharing my story, it kind of gives me the floor in a way that's humanizing, but it also makes it safe to not understand, to not agree, to feel the same thing, to empathize, because it's just about me kind of saying my piece. It's cathartic in a way because it, it creates connection. It makes the world a little more open, a little more empathetic, a little more understanding, not unanimous, because political debate is built into our democracy. We're supposed to argue, but at least it makes the arguments feel a little more, a little more worthwhile. I wonder also what you're seeing in terms of the way that the world is dealing with COVID-19 and the coronavirus pandemic. You know, we've got a lot of organizations represented in our audience who are kind of feeling it out as they go, just like everybody else. Mm -hmm. For me, it's been fascinating slash heartening slash terrifying to watch the way that the world has responded to all of this and how things have gotten better and things have gotten worse and things have done the right, people have done the right thing and people have just done all the wrong things and, and every permutation <laughs> thereof and, and not knowing which way is up at times, probably not knowing which way is up most times, at least in my case, just because it's just, there's no roadmap for this. I wonder what you're seeing not just personally, but also culturally, as someone who watches culture and critiques culture very tightly, that either gives you hope or gives you pause for where we may be headed with all of this. Is there anything that you're seeing that gives you more hope than concern about where COVID-19 will take us? The pandemic is... You know, I mean, many, many people have said this better than I'm about to say it. But the thing about the pandemic is this virus has essentially exposed a lot of stuff that was already there, right? Um, everything that was already true just seems truer now. And it has allowed people to express things in different ways that they, than they, than they were expressing before. Um, you know, the way in which the mask has become this, this political symbol um, only tells you that that, that that energy has just migrated from some other place. Um, and it's just attached itself to this, to this thing. Um, you know, our, dis, our distaste for government has just migrated to the mask. Our, our masculinity issues have migrated to the mask. Our perverse and like distorted idea of what American patriotism is has moved itself to the mask um, and then to the protests. I feel like, I don't know. I mean, I, I feel like I wanna, I, I'm an optimistic person by nature, but I'm also a pragmatist. And there's a degree to which my pragmatism won't allow my optimism to do its job. Um, I don't think we don't get off that easy with this with this pandemic, right? Like we elected who we elected as president. We have ignored our healthcare system, like you know, in a fundamental way for a long time. Um, we refuse to acknowledge the degree to which racism is such a critical component of so many people's lives and the ways in which it is baked into every stage of, of, of life in this country. If you, are, if you are especially a Black person or a Native American, um, you, the ways in which the economy works, the, the, the virus is exposed, you know, how capitalism is, is simultaneous, I mean, it's unavoidable in this country, it's, this, it's our system, but the ways in which that system is bound up in, you know, these other problems that we refuse to solve. We have been very complacent with respect to global warming in this country. Um, and all of those things, the idea that all of those things are talking right now 
while this virus is happening, but in no way because of this virus, says to me that the virus is this amplifier that, of these other dysfunctions that we, I think we have to listen to. And the idea, like this idea that we were just gonna get this magical vaccine in November, I mean, I would love that, but we don't deserve that. We deserve to actually fix our problems and not rush a vaccine before it's ready to make this stuff go away. I mean, there's no quick fix solution to any of these problems. And I feel like having a vaccine tomorrow that may or may not work, that what is it, what are the latest numbers? 30% of people won't take anyway because they don't trust that, it, that it's been through its proper vetting or that Donald Trump is responsible for it or they're just, you know, anti-vaxxers in the first place. I feel like this virus is telling us all this shit that we have to listen to. And the, if I'm hopeful about anything, I mean, in, in the degree to which my optimism wants to do its job, it's to believe that when we come out on the other side of this, enough of us will have learned all of the necessary lessons that, that, that would, prevent something like this from happening as catastrophically in this country as it's happened. Wesley Morris, culture critic for the New York Times and co-host of the podcast, Still Processing with Jenna Wortham. Wesley, thank you for making time for us. Thank you for doing this with me. I, you're a wonderful conversation partner. I mean, I already knew that, but um, I've never gotten to talk to you for this long. So I am honored. Thanks for having me, by the way, everybody, and both of us. <laughs>